All right, so uh, thanks for coming out for our uh, debugging tools and techniques talk. Um, we've got uh, basically two parts to this presentation where we first talk about some uh, general techniques that aren't um, technology specific and uh, some stories to share there and also interested in, in stories that any of you have to share with the rest of us about uh, debugging battles that uh, you've won or lost. and. Um, and then we have a, a series of, uh, of tools that we wanted to uh, talk about and demonstrate, I think, uh, that can help with your debugging. All right. So, yeah, let's uh, start with some techniques. So here's one. I think that, uh, that sometimes we fall victim to forming a hypothesis when we're debugging something. Like, oh, I think it's because there's clock drift. And then you could spend hours, days, maybe even weeks trying to battle the, the horrors of clock drift where, say, maybe you think that one server is five seconds out of, out of sync with another server, only to find out weeks later that it was a problem with um, anything else, really, that, that wasn't clock drift. There's, there's infinite possibilities. So I think the real trick here is uh, you, it's definitely a good idea to generate ideas like that. Clock drift often is a source of bugs. But um, you've got to test it. So maybe go change your code, figure out, uh, print out the times, print out the relative times, figure out if there really is a difference in the clocks. And if you find that there is, you can go deeper on that. But you may find that the clocks are only 20 milliseconds apart, and then you need to come up with a new hypothesis. So that's really, it, it's, it's a common trap to stick with one untested hypothesis for too long. So, All right. This. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, oftentimes uh, it's a little overwhelming to try to find the the source of a problem. You know, your 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 code that's misbehaving is a, a big ball of spaghetti. Uh, the Linux kernel is a big ball of spaghetti. The internet is a giant ball of spaghetti, and trying to monitor all of those things to find out what's going on is is probably a hopeless battle. But there are often uh, pinch points in between these things uh, with well-defined APIs, well-defined behaviors, and you can go and look at those points to see what's actually happening uh, and, and to help narrow down your, your focus. So if you have, uh, you know, the, your, uh, and this happened relatively recently, you know, the, the uh, JSON encoding for some REST call that you're doing isn't coming out right, and you're not sure whether it's happening on the client or the server side because, because of course, it's all hidden behind uh, behind other libraries. Um, being able to go and look at um, your TCP IP stack uh, on your end, seeing what's coming out of your app, is a, a place where you can look at that. Um, or you know, sy system calls. Which file? Which file is it that I can't open? <laughs> Which I'm sure we've all had the can you know file doesn't exist which file? I, you know. um. <clears throat> all right, yeah. Another one. Uh, if it's not working on on your machine, try it on someone else's machine. Um, and of course, uh, these days we have Docker, which fixes a lot of the it works on my machine problems because you can have my machine on your machine. But um, there, there are times when it actually is a hardware problem, and um, you'll find uh, your, your Dockerized thing works fine on one machine and not another. Um, fun thing lately is, is with uh, Mac having moved to ARM, their Docker on my machine is not the same as, as these, actually these two computers right here. It will com <laughs> behave completely differently with the same Docker file. Yeah. But uh, even, even between two machines with the same CPU type, uh, sometimes there are differences. So uh, I, I have a, a series of, of short stories here, some of my uh, previous debugging challenges. Um, I once drove to Burlington to help a, uh, a, uh, a pharmaceutical company who was having trouble uh, installing the Oracle database. They had instructions. They are very good instructions from head office. Here's how you install Oracle on, on Windows Server 2005 or whatever it was. Um, and every time they tried, it would crash. And then they would try it on their own laptops, and it would work. And then they do the same things on the server, and it would crash. And it turned out 
the installer was written in Java, and the installer came with a bundled Java runtime that was a semantic uh, Java runtime that had a just-in-time compiler that generated instructions that don't run on Pentium 4. <laughs> so when you run the installer, if, you, if you're running anything older than a Pentium 4, the installer works great. If you're running the installer in Pentium 4 or later, it crashes because it generates invalid instructions. And uh, how do we figure that out? Well, we figured it out because they were telling me it's like it works on all of our other machines, but not the server we have to install it on. And uh, the instructions they had from head office were six months old. They were like older than the machine that they were installing it on. So we did some, we did some Googling and we figured out, um, OK, this error means that uh, the JIT generated bad machine code. And so uh, we were there, thankfully, there was also a workaround in that, in that uh, instruction. They said, if you copy the whole install CD onto your hard drive and delete the semantic JIT DLL, It'll run, the whole it'll run the whole installer in interpreted mode, and it succeeds. It just doesn't try to generate machine code anymore. Um, so that, that had a happy ending, but it, it could have also been, well, we just can't install it. But at least we know why. You need a new computer. Yeah, new computer. You need an older Old. computer. Yeah. <laughs> um, another story I had was uh, we were running a, a web server for a company that I used to work for um, in our our own uh, on-site data center, which was a kind of a, a closet, and a windowless office that we had put a bunch of computers into. And uh, we were, it was behaving really strangely. Uh, we had a, it was a Java app that had a Postgres backend. And uh, our web pages started getting corrupted with like weird data. It didn't look right. And um, eventually we figured out that computer had a bad memory management unit. And when it ran out of memory and it was starting to swap to the hard drive, when it was reading back um, pages of memory from the hard drive, they would come back as all zero. Ooh. And uh, we had to completely rebuild that entire database because Postgres had been swapping and it saved a bunch of zero pages that it had swapped back in. And the whole database was just uselessly corrupted. So, so it can happen. Just that it's usually not the hardware, but don't, don't skip past that as a possible reason, because sometimes it is. And then the last story, uh, sort of a follow-on from that, it wasn't that Mac Mini, but uh, we had a bunch of servers that behaved really weird on Sunday afternoons in that uh, data center. Um, <laughs> and uh, months and months went by. We, it's like a bunch of stuff was crashing every Sunday afternoon, and we didn't know why. So I went in there. I thought maybe someone was vacuuming. Maybe it's static electricity. I don't know. We went in, and it was like 45 degrees in that room on Sunday afternoon because the ventilation was turned off in the building from Friday, end of day, <laughs> until Monday, beginning of day. And by Sunday afternoon, this room full of servers with no ventilation. Yeah. So yeah, just uh, think, think sometimes it is hardware. You, you have to think about where, where is this machine? Is it being treated well? The, the, cloud, the cloud is better, but. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, bonus question. Does anyone know what this image is? Someone might recognize it. Yes, it was exactly that. Um, Navy tech. The first computer bug. Uh, I think uh, Grace Hopper didn't find it, but she wrote this log entry and taped the, this moth into the logbook. Um, <laughs> it's found in uh, February 1931, I think. Uh, first. It says, yeah, first actual case of a bug being found is what's written under it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, be wary of time and date problems. Um, there's uh, a few people here I'm sure, uh, who I know for sure because we've talked about it before. But uh, anytime you're dealing with time and date, that, that there's, you know, here there be dragons. Um, you need to look at, you know, does, does a, a bug happen only overnight or at certain times of day? Um, Know about your database system and how it stores dates, how it interprets dates, because that can be uh, different from database to database, and there are often some surprises there. Um, be really careful about anything that uses uh, the old Java Util uh, date-related classes or the, the Java SQL date class. Uh, definitely prefer the newer, uh, the newer date classes. Um, 
uh, you know, I, well, the story, I think the story is yours. I have a story. This, this story happened to me twice, so I didn't learn the first time. <laughs> uh, uh, Christoph might remember, uh, we used to work together, um, and uh, we were testing, we were doing an end-to-end -end test of when new people join the system, we send them a welcome message, and our end-to-end -end test of that message was failing every night between midnight and 6 a.m. And it worked great during the day. We could never reproduce the problem during the day, but every night between midnight and 6 a.m., the test wouldn't pass. Uh, and now at DNA Stack, we have a, a similar test for, a, I think, a similarly welcome email in our system. And we had a very similar problem, and we spent a long time trying to debug it. And, and I should have known better because <laughs> I went through it once before, but um, it turns out uh, not, not all IMAP servers have the beginning of the day at midnight. Uh, sometimes it's midnight, I mean midnight UTC, sometimes it's midnight local time. So for example, uh, if you check your email with uh, Gmail, the Gmail uh, IMAP server, when you search for messages on a certain day, it happens at uh, midnight Pacific time. No matter where you are in the world, the, the day starts at, at midnight Pacific time. And so eventually, uh, when you realize that, I think it took us until we went through a daylight saving time transition, and the time when the test was failing changed by an hour. And then we thought, OK, there's something, something going on here. So um, definitely be wary of, of dates and time zones. And, and if, if something only happens at a certain time of day, it's almost certainly a time zone or software bug. Well, and, and it, if the thing happens between midnight and four-ish in the morning, four or five in the morning, it's, yeah. it's probably to do with UTC. Yeah. Uh, so this is actually Mike, who unfortunately wasn't feeling well, so he couldn't make it here, uh, suggested this. Uh, it's a zine with a, a bunch of uh, uh, really good uh, tips and tricks for debugging uh, strategies and so on. Um, and so a few, a few tips that, that have come out, uh, come out of it. Uh, inspect, don't squash. So like, you know, if something's broken, don't just like wipe it out and move on. Uh, you know, you need to be able to look at the problem in order to find what the cause was. Um, uh, being stuck is temporary, right? It, it can be really demoralizing when you're stuck. You have no idea why this this thing isn't working. You know, it, it worked yesterday. Why why is it broken now, etc. That can be a really hard thing to just like continue through. And just keep in mind the the you know being in that state is a temporary thing. You'll you'll get through it. Um, Trust nobody and nothing, and I would say, especially yourself. Uh, the, uh, you know, like, don't assume that anything is correct. Uh, he, Jonathan talked about hardware issues. Uh, I remember back from college, uh, we had an assignment, and I was opening the same file for read and write as two separate file handles, which apparently in AIX at the time, this is 20 plus years ago, uh, caused a kernel bug, and so your writes never really happened in the right order anymore. It, you know, you get all kinds of weird behavior, and I had no idea what was going on, and I was frustrated. And like, the heart of that was that I I trusted that the operating system was right, and it's not always. It usually is. It's usually your code. Every once in a while, um, which takes us to number four. <laughs> yep, which takes us to the next one. It's probably your code, right? Like as much as it happens, it, you know. There, there's, uh, I don't know if anyone here is a fan of the, uh, the show House, the, the doctor who does the, uh, the diagnostics. Uh, you know, there was a quote in one of, his, in one of the episodes where he said, uh, uh, where someone said, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. Um, you know, like, yes, libraries can be broken. Yes, it's possible that OpenSSL has a bug that means that, you know, connections don't work. There are a few million people on the planet using OpenSSL every minute or so. The odds that there's a bug there are probably lower than the code that you wrote three minutes ago that no one's ever used before. So start at your code, <laughs> work your way back out, you know? Um, don't go it alone. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not someone who does a lot of pair programming, um, but I find actually one of the most useful times to grab a coworker or a friend to sit down and work through a problem is when you're trying to debug an issue. Because that second pair of eyes will help keep you grounded. It'll help you, st like, help stop you from 
uh, holding on to assumptions that you've made without testing them, right? Because more often than not, you know, you'll be like, oh, it's got to be this time issue. That, that's the problem. You know, if you've got a second person there, they're far more likely to go, does it really have to be that? Sorry. You know, let's take that second to, to just make sure, you know? Um, there is always a reason why stuff is broken. Uh, some of the hardest things to debug are often, you know, things that happen sporadically or from from all uh, from your point of view randomly. Um, there is a cause. Something is happening. Uh, so you know, find what that cause is. You know, there is something to find there. Um, build out your toolkit, and hopefully, the rest of this talk will help give you a few more tools to put into your utility belt. Um, and it can be an adventure. As, as frustrating as going through debugging can be, uh, it's also really rewarding. Like when you find that issue that you know everyone's been staring at for months and no one ever figured out, and you finally realize, oh, it's that thing, uh, that can be one of the most rewarding parts of our jobs. Uh, not to mention the bragging rights. So, you know, uh, have fun with it. Yeah, so what? <clears throat> One more slide on, on this excellent guide. Um, it has about 50 different items in it. Each one has a, a full page comic associated with it. Uh, and it's all sage advice. Um, some of it uh, you'll probably have learned yourself painfully. But uh, the ones that you haven't, you'll be glad to have uh, found, th found them out uh, before, before the pain. So uh, yeah, number one, reread the error message. Yes. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's already telling you what's wrong. You just skipped over that. Uh, so that's, that's very good advice. Um, reproduce the bug. Uh, that's, of course, um, the goal. All, all the bugs that we find, we want them to be reproducible. The, the most elusive are the ones that it's difficult to do that with. But it's usually possible once you understand the cause. So you have to get there. Um, draw a diagram. I love this one. I'm, I'm a very spatial thinker. Um, I've often been able to solve problems by trying to draw a picture of the problem, and then I realize, oh, wait, this line is missing, or this is an extra line, or whatever it is. Uh, so drawing a diagram is good. And, and that, that goes really well together with uh, don't go it alone, because you can really use a diagram to help uh, bring someone else in to help you. If you've understood it to a point, the diagram's a great way to bring someone else in and show them. Um, write a tiny program. This is another great one. Uh, you can often isolate a bug just by writing a small program that uh, does the thing that wasn't working. Usually, when you start, it's working, because most stuff does work. But as you make the program more and more like the thing that was failing, you'll eventually add the part that makes it stop working. And uh, that's really useful. Um, tidy up your code. I have personal experience with uh, having done this and fixed a bug because of it. Um, I was trying to debug something where I knew, like, you know, using immutable values, values that can't change after you assign, you assign to a variable, it has that value forever. That's a better way of programming. You, you, it's easier to reason about the code. And I was trying to reason about this code that wasn't doing what I expected. And I thought, OK, it will be easier to figure out what it's doing if I just change the whole, the whole function so that uh, every variable only gets one value. They're all final. And by the time I was finished making all the variables final, the bug was gone. So that, that can be good. And plus, now the code is better for the next person who comes along, because it's easier to understand. Um, so tidying up your code is definitely a good, a good strategy there. Explaining the problem out loud, uh, there's the classic, explain it to a duck. Um, our CTO actually has a rubber duck uh, at his desk. Um, <laughs> So explain it to a duck often works. Uh, human works even better. But if you don't have one, a rubber duck is a good uh, proxy. And in writing, uh, I have often found bugs trying to post a Stack Overflow. Like, I tried this, I tried this, I tried, oh, I should say I tried this. I'm going to go do it. Oh, that was it. I found it. <laughs> so uh, trying to explain in writing and explain that you've, you've really exhausted all the avenues, there probably is one that you haven't. And if you try to explain it in writing, maybe you'll find the bug. Um, and by the way, if you, if you care about Stack Overflow internet points, um, you can answer your own questions. So <laughs> you can post, post the question and, and the answer. Um, make, uh, make sure your code is running. OK, show of hands, who has spent hours debugging 
code, making changes, running it, and then realizing later that the changes weren't in the running code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you could add this week to that. Yeah. Site, so that's <laughs> <on my hand. laughs> Yeah. So that's that's a big one. Uh, make sure your code is running. If if you're ever unsure, put in a print statement or throw an exception or something that will make it really obvious that your change is in there. Um, more often than not, when you suspect that, that is the problem. Um, and finally, uh, this, this was uh, two, two hints combined, but write a failing test. Definitely, uh, you can save so much time uh, if you first write a test that fails. There's uh, one reason is you don't have to work through the UI again or work through whatever the inputs are that cause the bug because your test is doing it. Secondly, I don't know how, how many people here, but I have multiple times run into sort of a, a, a Titanic test, an unsinkable test that it, it can't fail. Um, the test itself may exercise the code in a useful way, but there's no possible way that the test will ever fail. If you write a failing test, you're guaranteed your test is useful. Your test is only useful if it can fail when the, when the behavior that it's looking for causes it to fail. Um, so writing a failing test up front saves you having to go back and undo your bug fix and check if your test can fail. And finally, uh, shorten your feedback loop, which I think goes hand in hand with having a, a test that fails. But uh, anything else you can do. If you have to deploy the thing to, to the staging environment to see it fail, maybe you want to figure out a way to do that locally so you can see, uh, see your changes and, and what they did much sooner. Oh, Judy has a... Writing, writing a failing test is also helpful. Like some, sometimes the, the, the first scenario required a certain setup that you can really like, uh, like the sometimes if you just try to replicate it, you might not be able to replicate it, but if you try to, to like uh, set up in, in the test environment, you you will definitely be able to repeat it. And also human does not trust it. Definitely, yep. I like the rubber duck. Yeah, everyone get a rubber duck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll go through uh, some tools. We've tried to focus on the, you know, ev everyone has written log entries, everyone's used print statements, uh, everyone hopefully has used, uh, you know, the, the debugger in their IDE before. Um, we're tr we tried here to, to pick out things that are maybe a little bit outside of that realm. Uh, I think both Jonathan, Jonathan and I have been doing this for a fairly long time, you know, uh, have, have done a lot of sysadmin type work, a lot of the, you know, packet inspection, that sort of stuff. Uh, so we tried to find those tools that maybe were a little bit less familiar for people. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the app you're making, uh, or the app that you're working on made or maybe should have made uh, an HTTP request. And you want to have a look at that request. Um, if you're not sure, and I, I mentioned this this earlier, this was a, a, an issue that we had at, at uh, where, where we're working. Uh, someone was having trouble with uh, some JSON that was supposed to be being sent to a, a, a REST service, and the wrong thing was showing up on the other side. But generally, inside the application, by the time you're looking at it, you're not looking at what was sent, you're looking at how that was interpreted by eight layers of libraries between the network stack and what you're looking at. And so knowing even which machine is making the mistake, the server or the client, can be challenging. So go look at the, the network. Look at what actually traveled over the network to the other machine, and that at least cuts your possibilities in half, because now you're either looking at the client if the thing was wrong on the, net, on the, the line, or you're looking at the server if it was right when it left and it was wrong by the time you're looking at it, right? Um, and so a tool for doing that in Unix-like systems uh, is TCP dump. Oh, whoa, sorry. Um, so uh, we have a, an example here of uh, the command line that you would use. So you can say sudo, because this, you need to be super user to use uh, TCP dump. Uh, you give it the network interface that you want it to keep an eye on. Uh, the, the size of the packet you're expecting, uh, generally this is a pretty safe value. Um, you tell it you want it to print things out as, as ASCII and what, uh, what filter you want to use. And so you're saying anything that's going out where the port number that the communication is happening on is port 80 or whatever else you, you, you need to look at. 
And so to find some of these values the, for the, uh, the interface, uh, if you're on Mac OS or a BSD based system like OpenBSD, NetBSD, you can use if config. Uh, in most current Linuxes, uh, you would use IP address or ADDR. Uh, either way, you'll get a whole bunch of output that, uh, that includes, you know, for each uh, interface on your system, what is the IP address, and, and in there will be the name of the interface. And so you can, you can pull this EN0 value out from there. And so you can just grab this. So while Angelo is doing that, I can also introduce the, the troublemaker. So we made a little Java app that uh, simulates various badly behaved apps. I think we're, we're both going to hell now because we wrote so many, uh, so many little functions that have terrible error reporting. <laughs> but we're going to show you how to overcome that in case you run into other software that does that. All right. So, uh, so uh, we're calling this thing, and it's supposed to make an HTTP request, and we're getting bad status back. Why? I, w I wonder what it called or what yeah, status I have no idea. it was. Yeah. What was the bad status? I have no idea. Um, so what we can do is oops, uh, TCP. Actually, uh, I can do it in the same window. Never oh. write code that does that. But. Yeah, <laughs> please. I, actually, another pet peeve. Never write a log statement where you write the error message from an exception without including the exception, because the stack trace will be there. Yes. But anyways, uh, actually, uh, if config. So here we have my, my set of interfaces, and uh, this guy. Looks yeah, like EN0 looks, is probably it. Yeah, 192.168, that's, that's a pretty safe bet. That's probably the one. It'll so. be one of the ones that has status active. Uh, so I can do TCP dump uh, dash I in zero. Let me go back and check. Uh, you missed a space. Ooh, thank you. I used to say the first rule of live coding demos is never do live coding demos. But, <laughs> you know, this is, oh. this is every time with TCP dump. First you run it, and then you run it with sudo. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right. And so we're, we're watching in this window. And I'm going to go back here and run it again. And we got our error again. Now let's go back here and look. And we can scroll back, and you can see there's all these uh, these packets, and there's a bunch of garbled stuff there that doesn't really look useful. But oh, here, I've got a bunch of HTTP headers here. That that's that looks about right. And oh look, I've got 401 unauthorized, right? But what did I go to reach out to? I, I you know again I can keep scrolling back, and oh there's a get. So you know I'm I'm getting something that's got you know that where the path is status 401. Right, and you can see um, the host header there too. Yeah, and the host name is httpbin.org. So now I know what was I trying to reach out to. You know, what's the the host, the path, and what was the response, mm. right? Um, and so there's no question here what's happening anymore because I, I, that's what was on the network. So uh, what would you use something like this as opposed to maybe using the postman to communicate against? The so Postman is if I want to hit something, right? This is, let's say, for example, you've, uh, you know, you've inherited some terrible code. You inherited my terrible code at one point, so you, you would know this. <laughs> David, David took, over, took over for me when I left at a, a previous job. I, I, um, so you know, you've inherited some code, and it's, you know, you're getting these errors in the log that say, you know, like, uh, request failed. What request? What is this thing talking about? I can observe what's happening here. In, uh, Postman is great. I, I use it, uh, well, we use uh, something called Insomnia, but essentially the same sort of thing. It's awesome when it's like, I've got this service. Yes. I know that's what I'm calling. I know this is the request that's being made, but I don't really know exactly what's coming back. I want to kind of play around with it a little bit. It's great for that. 
Um, but this is more like something is happening between those two, and I just right. want to kind of listen in and see what's so see what's going on. Okay, looking at a live system. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's get back into slideshow. Yeah. So the next one's a variation on on the theme. Um, I don't think we prepared a demo for this one, but uh, as Angelo said, port number 80, that's HTTP. Uh, there's lots of other ports that are interesting. 5432 is uh, usually the Postgres port, if you use that database, or um, uh, MySQL, same, a any database that you're using. Um, you can inspect the traffic that's going between one process and another process uh, by looking at uh, TCP dump on the on the port number that that server listens on, and uh, that's especially if you use something like JPA that writes the SQL for you. You don't know what SQL it made, and it won't tell you. It's it's kind of frustrating sometimes. Uh, there are some trace logs that will tell you, but even then, they don't always tell you the exact thing. But you can be sure exactly what SQL is going to the database. If you use TCP dump, you can see the SQL statement going across the wire, and you can see the response coming back from the database. Now, I'll, I'll point out, plain text is there, and that is key here. If you're using TCP dump on something that's not plain text, if it's an HTTPS connection, or um, Postgres can be set up to use an encrypted uh, connection, unfortunately, TCP dump is gonna give you a bunch of garbage. <laughs> And I mean, that's expected, right? Like, that's the whole point. It's encrypted. You can't go sniffing at it like that. Our GRPC would also be a problem. Too. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, but at least for some of these things, there are tools you can still use. So let's say your app is making an HTTPS request instead, and something's going wrong, and the logging is crappy. Um, TCP dump isn't going to help you. Right. Um, actually, even if your your app is making an HTTP one point or a two point request, HTTP, uh, TCP dump can be a little iffy because uh, the new new version of HTTP is is essentially a binary protocol under the hood. So it can be almost impossible for you to just read what's going on. Um, but um, if you can restart the application that you're that's making the request and it's a Java app, um, you can turn on some debugging in Java so it will spit out into the into your, uh, well, onto standard out uh, or wherever the logging is happening. Um, it'll spit out additional information, including the content of the packets before and after encryption. It'll include a bunch of information about the, uh, the handshake that's going on. So if you're having trouble with an SSL handshake, which I, I hope you never have, have that trouble because it's a nightmare to figure out what's going on, but this is a tool that can help. You'll learn more about SSL than you ever wanted to know. But, you know. Uh, so if you pass uh, this, oop, I keep wanting to highlight things. <coughs> Excuse me. If you pass javax net debug equals all uh, to the Java command line, uh, it will spit out a cornucopia of information for you. Um, and see here. Uh, let's do this one. So we can do that with this previous thing. And you can see again, we have all this, uh, this HTTP 1.1 authorized again. We can see the content again of an HTTP request. Um, this one was via, uh, via HTTPS, so if we scroll back a little further, we can see we're doing a get status, again to HTTP bin, but this one is calling the HTTPS uh, version of that. Um, and so you can see in here, uh, SSL input, uh, engine input record, you can see all of these steps along the way uh, for what, what did the handshake look like, etc. cetera. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of of extra information. You can see there's a lot that came out of that uh, uh, command. Um, for, for interest, since I mentioned HTTP2, uh, if we do that without forcing the version, um, you'll note we're not going to see get anywhere here. And it's because this is HTTP2 and so that whole thing was a binary 
pass. Now, uh, you might be able to write something that will interpret all of the hex that's going back and forth somehow. The information's there, um, but that might you might be better off looking down another avenue. Right? You, you'll have a, a much shorter feedback loop if, if you're looking for this in other ways. But it, the tooling is there. Um, so. Oops. Yep. So the big difference between this one and TCP dump is, uh, th well, first of all, this only works for Java programs. Yep. And secondly, that you have to be able to run the Java program with this um, system property turned on. Whereas with TCP dump, you can it works. It doesn't matter what language the the program was written in. You can still inspect the traffic, but not if it's encrypted. Yeah, and in theory, if the the application is already running in staging, right? Like I've had, I had a problem a very long time ago where you know an app would get into a state eventually where stuff got weird, and so it wasn't like I could just leave it running on my machine forever until it got weird by after restarting it, but I could go onto the machine, the staging box run TCP dump and start to see what was actually happening, right? Like the app can be running and running for real. In theory, you could do this in production. If there's a security department at your company, they may have something to say about that. <laughs> um, you know, and if, you're, if you deal with sensitive information in any way, they will definitely have something to say about that. But, uh, you know, if you have a development environment where this is, is re reproducible, that might be a good place to be able to just start up TCP dump and see what's happening. Right, like so. All right, so um, yeah, if you want to debug a, a process that you didn't run in your IDE, um, you can uh, you can start the app somewhere else. Uh, we do this at, at work. We use the the Trino uh, SQL engine. Um, it's like a distributed uh, SQL database. Um, but uh, that part's not important, but the, the, the important part is that we don't start it from our IDEs, we start it from a command line launcher, but uh, we do write plugins that run inside of it. And so we want to be able to debug that VM, and there's lots of other examples of where you're, you've written some code and you want it to run in a VM that you don't start from inside of your IDE. Um, so you can set, uh, again, a, a Java command line parameter when you, when you launch the thing, in this case, it's that, uh, that line that's in red. And once you've done that, you can uh, set up a run configuration in your IDE to connect to the running process and then set breakpoints and debug it. Um, so yeah, uh, I think we have a demo for this one. So rather than talk about it, I think we can just show it. All right, and in this case, I'm actually, uh, so I'm, uh, on the slide it mentions you, you can set this uh, suspend to yes, and it'll pause the, the JVM just as it's starting until you connect. So if, you're, if your problem is happening during startup, that's a good option to keep in mind, right? Yeah. Uh, and so we've got that up and running, and oh, not that window, this one. Um, and so we can run a debug. Okay, and so you can see we're connected, and if we look over here, it's now spitting out random numbers, right? And so we're going to come down and have a look. Uh, random, there we are. And so we're going to drop a breakpoint, and it's stopped, and the, the next number is going to be negative 1132. And so we can step over and hey, look, that's, that's that yeah. one. Um, so this can be really handy. I, uh, a place I worked at uh, a while back, we used Wildfly, the, the container. And just because of the way that our setup was, you can run Wildfly from inside of IntelliJ, but it can be kind of painful to get it to work well. Uh, and so we did this. We just start Wildfly up. And, and start it, you can pass the command line options in the startup. And we actually would, by default, start it with this low, in the development environments. We would start it with this on, but not suspend. And so it'll just run as normal, right? It runs a little slower than it would otherwise, but whatever. It's your development environment, who cares? And so if at any point while you're working, you need to check something, just connect a debugger. And 
you're, you're off to the races. Um, and for just a little bit of fun, you can see this is a, an, a, an infinite loop here. So we can oops, set value false. And off we go. Oops, and it exited. And back to here. The, uh, that app was running in an infinite loop uh, with a variable that was set to true. And so I just set the variable to false and the loop exited. Because, yeah. Because um, with a debugger, you can override the value of a current variable. So, a little bit of fun there. Um, all right. Uh, so, your app's stuck. Yeah, particularly true with multi-threaded things, which almost everything nowadays is multi-threaded, even if you didn't write it to be, because <laughs> everything underneath you is being multi-threaded for you. Um, you can have deadlocks, live locks, uh, you know, you could be spinning in an infinite loop somewhere without realizing it, like that last app was. Um, one tool to get information out, and again, this the, one of the nice things about this is you can use it against a running JVM, let's say in your development or in this case, even really your production environment, right, uh, is to get a thread dump. And that will spit out a whole bunch of information about what, what threads are running inside this JVM and what is each of them doing. Um, and it doesn't really interfere with the running of the JVM. And so there's a few ways you can do this. Uh, you can send it uh, the uh, signal uh, th signal, signal number three in a Unix-like environment, which is sig quit, and you can do that by just doing the kill command. Uh, this won't kill the app, honest. Any, <laughs> any Java app will not quit if you have the negative three there. If you don't, the, the, I, I take no responsibility for whatever you just did. Um, <clears throat> or, uh, again, if you're if it's a terminal app and you're able to get onto the terminal where the app is already running, if you hit Control and I always get these where this is backsplash, uh, backslash, yeah. um, it'll do the same thing. It'll basically behave as if you sent it that kill signal. <coughs> if you do either of those, uh, it'll spit out a thread dump onto standard output. If that's inconvenient, because it can be, let's say for example this is like Tomcat. Well, standard output is going to probably go to Catalina.out, the file, and that file can get busy, <laughs> right? And so getting this big, giant blob of text in the middle of Catalina.out is not the most convenient thing in the world. There is also a command that you can run from the command line, uh, J JCMD. You, can, you have to go find the, the process ID for your, your application, but if you run J command, uh, the PID number, and thread.print, It'll spit that out in the terminal where you ran this J command thing instead. Um, and so that can be handy uh, as well. So let's uh, let's have it go with that. Uh, which one were we going to do this with? I think there? it's deadlock. Oh, yeah, Troublemaker right. deadlock. Yes. Just grab it. Why is this? Don't mind me. <laughs> and this is why I say don't ever do live demos. Uh, uh, I think there's a hyphen in there. Yeah, I think you're right. There we go. Okay. So we've got this app, and it was supposed to do something, start spitting out I1, but it's not, and I don't know what's going on. So I can, since we're, we're uh, since this isn't overly busy, I can do this the easy way. And so I just hit control backslash, and we got all this stuff. And so we can scroll back and, and see what is what are all these threads doing, right? Um, and so we've got this player one thread, and it's blocked on some sort of object monitor. And we've got this player two thread, and it's blocked on this object monitor. But those things are supposed to be like, you know, try, trying to find out what's going on. They, they, oh, well, I mean, if they're both blocked, 
And if I come down here and look, you know, it, uh, where is it? It's a little bit up from here. Scroll it. There. There we are. So you can see player one is trying to get a lock on something that's held by player two. Player two is waiting to get a lock on something that's held by player one. We've got a deadlock, right? So you, you can use this type of output, like this, this thread dump, to find those sorts of like multi-threading problems, which are often some of the trickiest to reproduce, right? Because it's a question of when, you know, timing. When did these things happen? Um, and so it can be very handy. And like I said, it's very non-invasive, which is nice because you can run it against a, a real running system. Um, but let's kill that because I don't have a good way to stop a deadlock. Uh, and let's get back here. All right, so uh, system interactions. Um, so this is another one of those pinch points in the, in the spaghetti diagram that we were looking at earlier. Um, when, when your application is running, if it wants to do anything observable at all, it has to make system calls. So calls into the, the operating system kernel to, to print, to the standard out, to open files, to write to files, to open network sockets, to read and write network sockets. Everything, that, everything observable that an application does is done through system calls. And this is a great pinch point because you can observe it unless you're running on Mac. Uh, we've <laughs> found out for sure. Um, Mac used to, well, it actually still comes with a tool called Dtrace, which is an amazing, great system for, uh, for reading system calls. But um, Dtrace is disabled for all signed binaries now on Mac OS, which is all of them. So uh, you, can't, you can't use Dtrace anymore on Mac. But uh, uh, we set up, a, um, we set up a, a Linux system in a Docker container so we can show strace, which is a Linux, uh, Linux system call uh, tracer. Um, and uh, th this is really handy if you want to know anything about file sockets, uh, any kind of um, observable thing that your app is doing. Yeah, for a long time, the... Uh, exception that would come out when you open a file uh, and it can't open it because let's say it doesn't exist was file doesn't exist. Which file? No. Or it would say error node two. Yeah, that's a <laughs> that that's a, a a great one that like C programs you would get this error node two like <laughs> like so the uh, this is uh, handy for that now. Let's see here. So I'm going to just jump into this Docker container. And so I know this command line looks huge. We used JBang to write this troublemaker script. And uh, unfortunately, if you try to run strace directly against it, it strace's the shell script that JBang runs instead of the actual Java app. So this is the, the full command that JBang ends up creating for your Java application. Uh, just to explain why it's so huge. The bit that's really interesting here is you, you essentially have, you know, strace ff and then your Java application, right? Um, and so this spits out uh, a whole lot of stuff here. Um, this particular Java app, actually I should run it. File not found. Which file? I don't know. So let's find out. Uh, so if we run this, um, now finding what you're looking for here can be challenging, right? Because as Jonathan said, everything your application does essentially is going to be making system calls, like almost constantly, especially a Java app is going to make a lot of system calls. Um, but if you know sort of what you're looking for, in this case, we're looking for oh, we're looking for a file being opened, right? Um, I can look for open at, which is the the 
uh, system call that, that would be used. And I can kind of, that helps like lower, lower the set of things. And importantly, this was, we went all the way to the bottom and then searched backwards because yeah. it's usually when something goes wrong, it's the last thing that the program yeah. did. Yeah. Um, this would be challenging if you have a larger program that's going to keep running even though you had this error. It's still possible. Mm -hmm. But you are like, you know, we're, we're not going to uh, lie that's, to you about it. That's a key there. Yeah. So if you, you, when you're seeing this e no ent negative one, uh, if in the case of a file that you couldn't find, you know, no such file or directory, oh, hey, okay, that, that sounds like it might be it. And if you go back just a little bit, here's the system call, open at, not a file, uh, for read, only for read, and then, you know, et cetera. Um, so again, S-Trace isn't the sort of thing you're going to pull out of your pocket every day, but every once in a while, it will be the difference between spending an hour debugging a thing because you spent the time digging through S-Trace and spending six weeks digging through the thing because you don't know what happened, right? I've so. also used it on a, a program that read a whole bunch of config files out of a directory, and then it would say syntax error. Wouldn't tell you which file or which line. It would just it would read in the whole directory and then say syntax error. And it was eventually tracing the system calls helped me because it said syntax error as soon as it read the part that it didn't like. So not only did we figure out which file it was, but where in the file, because it had read just that much, and then it couldn't parse that part, and it just gave up and said syntax error. So you have to be able to reproduce the problem, and then you can run this again. Yes. Yeah. yeah, some of these tools are... are a, a lot of these techniques will rely on you reproducing first and then working back. A few don't, TCP dump being a good example, thread dumps being another. But yeah, uh, SysTrace, you're going to need to be able to, to somehow trigger the problem. This also have to, <clears throat> this is required to, to be able to yes. get access. So SysTrace needs root, and in fact, because uh, we're, we're working on a Docker container here, um, there are uh, things you won't be able to do with, uh, so uh, if you're on a real machine, uh, you know, like not Docker and not a Mac, because Mac cuts S-Trace off at the knees, um, if you're on some other host, a real Linux box, let's say, uh, you can S-Trace uh, dash P and a process ID and connect to something that's already running. Uh, you can't in Docker, because if you could, you could probably break your way out of the Docker jail. And so Docker doesn't let you, unless you provide certain specific command line arguments to starting the, the Docker container. Um, and you can't in Mac because Mac just won't let you do anything, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so, but that is, so if it's already running, that is a way to do it. Like I said, guys, the large applications, S-Trace is going to be kind of painful. But every once in a while, it is invaluable. So it's a good thing to keep in your back pocket. If you have an idea about which system call you're looking for, you can pipe the output through grep. Yep. That helps. If, especially if you know that it was a file not found, you could you could search for that eno ent. Yeah. And then you would have a much better uh, idea of where it's happening. I think it's there's, uh, something like this when, when we try to debug something with the Golang code. Yes, Go, Golang stuff is uh, definitely, this is helpful because you can't get the source code back from it. You can't reverse compile it. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to point out this. Uh, there's a kind of flag that you can actually, if you can turn it on, you can actually use it. But something like uh, Kubernetes, or even like in a container where you cannot get gain root access, you won't be able to use this. That's right. Yeah. You yeah. need you need root access to be able to uh, to trace system calls. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, as I said, if you want to connect to an existing uh, process ID, you can, but not through Docker. Uh, you, you need like a, a real OS to do that. Um, all right. Okay. What's taking so long, or so much, in some cases? You know, like something's using a ton of memory. There's no reason why this application should be it should be using so much memory, or why the memory should be growing at this rate. Um, these are sometimes rather difficult to trace down. And so a profiler can be hugely helpful. There are a bunch of commercial ones out there. 
Uh, I have no recommendations because uh, the, the few that I've used weren't really any better than the free tools. So they weren't bad, they just weren't better than the things you can get for free. Um, and then there are others that are far more expensive than the places I've worked in the past could afford and maybe they're better, I have no idea, but you know. Um, but the free ones, Visual VM in this case specifically, are free and easy to, fairly easy to use. Uh, so let's, let's have a look. So we're gonna start Troublemaker up again. And so we've got Troublemaker running. Okay. And so I'm gonna go over here and look at Visual VM and I probably should have closed that. And so this, you can see, is a current process ID. And it just showed up. Like Visual VM's running, any Java app that's running on your machine will show up in here. Um, and so we can have a quick look. Maybe. Yeah. There we go. Um, and so we can sort of poke around here and we can say, see, there's, you know, there's a relatively growing number of threads. Uh, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, uh, showing a memory leak in in real time in a, a talk is not going to be something that I can do all that well. Um, but I, I promise this thing consumes more memory constantly. Um, if only Google Chrome were written in Java. <laughs> yeah, then we'd just be able to look at that. Um, so um, we can poke around here and. Yep. And it was, for a while, included in the JVM distribution. Like, it, for a while, Visual VM was just part, when you installed Java, it was there. I don't remember which version they pulled it out in. I think they took it out in 9. Mm. They tried to, 9 was, uh, they tried to shrink a bunch of stuff. Yeah. But it's still up to date. It's still there. It's, it's, up, it's up to yep. date on J, JDK 20 now, I think. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. yeah. Yep. So, very handy. You can just grab it off of uh, uh, GitHub and... You're off to the races, um, but so here we've got. Let's look at the profiler, and so you can see we're got we're our uh, package name is tjug. So we're gonna look at oops all of the the all of the classes that are underneath tjug. Um, we're gonna look at memory, and so it's gonna connect. Oh wait, it was the sampler that ended up showing us. Oh no, this yeah. did too. This works. I think the sampler lets you see the uh, difference between snapshots. That's right. So that might be a better view. So let's stop that. Go back to the sampler memory. So the way the, the, way the sampler works is it, um, it basically just keeps running those uh, thread dumps that we talked about earlier. And it just remembers wh where are all of the threads. Um, for memory sampling, it looks at how, how many live objects are there of each type on the heap at, at each interval? Um, the profiler actually is, it changes the bytecode and knows about every single thing that happens, so it slows down your app. The sampler doesn't slow down your app very much because it's just checking in periodically and, and looking. You can drill into the program as well to uh, inspect the parts of it. Yes, you can, especially with the memory profiler. It, it takes a stack trace every time there's an allocation. Yeah. And so, uh, so this, I mean, right now, you know, uh, whatever twenty percent ish of all of the memory we're using is in uh, Java Lang object arrays. That's incredibly helpful. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Um, not really. I, I, I mean, if someone else can tell me what's wrong from that, you're a better developer than I am for sure. Um, but what we can do is we can switch to Delta. So the moment I push that button, now it's showing me what's happening to the memory relative to that point in time. So it's showing me has it grown or shrunk and by how much. Um, and so we probably just had a garbage collection there, but uh, okay. if we now, so one handy thing that I've found is if I go look at, uh, uh, if I go look for the classes that are part of my application, right? So the things that are under my, um, uh, like my package uh, space, then 
that can be very handy. And so I can look at this and I can say, you know, live bytes, okay, that's not really going to be helpful here. Live objects, there's this, the, this number keeps growing out of the corner. Like every, like, this keeps going up and up and up. I've got a lot of these things. Why? And now I can go look in, in the application and see what's going on. And so I can, uh, you know, if, if it takes longer to find these things, you can also do snapshots here. So I can say, so let me get rid of Delta mode. I can say, take a snapshot right Up now. So you perform a GC right before. Oh, that's a good, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Uh, let's get back to sampler. I can ask it to, and remember, you're always asking to perform a GC. You can't actually force the JVM to, to, to garbage collect. But so we'll, we'll ask it to perform a garbage collection, and then we'll take a snapshot, right? And then we can come back here and wait wait a little bit and then do the same thing again right and now I can say I want to compare these two snapshots right so that's that guy and now I'm getting that same delta view but between the two points in time that I snapshot it and so again I can go and say okay yeah okay great there's lots of byte buffers like that doesn't tell me anything but if I look for T-Jug, I can see why did I get eight more of these things? And if you leave a longer period of time, you know, like check your app after 20 minutes, an hour, whatever, you might see something that's very telling in this. Is it gonna solve every problem? No, obviously not. But it's clues along the way, right? Um, so. It's like you find bugs and also if you have your performance not performance. Exactly. Yeah. And there is, like, there is profiler, like, there is a profiler mode, like, in, in IntelliJ, and I think Eclipse has it as well. That's a little bit different in that you're looking at, you know, timing and whatever for the code that you're running. And as, as Jonathan pointed out, you have to be very careful with those type, because that's essentially a micro benchmark, right? Those types of micro benchmarks are just take it all with a grain of salt, right? Because you're, by inspecting it, you're slowing it down. By slowing it down, you're changing the results. So the thing that looks slow in a profiler isn't always really slow. But if the program is slow, then relatively it will be... Well, the thing is, is that your the profiler might lead you in the wrong direction, okay. right? And so uh, I've found, if you're trying to actually profile what is slow about an application, looking at, looking at this can be helpful for memory, um, for CPU, I found the best thing is to, to start like collecting, so observability, right? Start collecting the counts and how long things took, but do it in the app and collect that information and then like, uh, operate so based on that. Based on yeah. Your, uh, yeah. Um, all right. So that's that guy. Maybe. Oh, there we go. Oh. <laughs> I gave up too quickly. Uh, that was S trade, so that's Visual VM. There we are. All right. Uh, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so, service provider gives you a URL, and you're getting unresolved address exception, right? What's going on? I don't know. Um, you know, you're inter using internal host names. Let's say in in uh, a Kubernetes cluster you know, you're, to address your services one to the other and, and stuff is, isn't resolving properly. Your issues could just be DNS, right? And so dig or NS lookup, if you're on an older uh, version of a Unix-like system, uh, can provide you a whole bunch of information. Um, you know, DNS is basically a phone book. You're doing a lookup, oh wait. Uh, most of us are probably old enough to remember what a phone book is. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so if you do, you know, if you know that this is the, the host name that, that uh, they gave you, uh, you know, maybe they had a typo in, in what was handed to you, not that that's ever happened in, in history, right? Uh, you know, you can at least do a, a, a look up and see, like, are we ending up at a at a DNS uh, server that makes sense? Are we getting something back? Maybe the problem's in my app, right? Like, remember, the problem is probably in your code, right? So, like, yeah, it might be DNS. If you think it's DNS, check. 
right? And you can eliminate it if it isn't, or prove it if it is. Um, another one that, that's happened to me before, DNS is round robin. So if you have multiple IP addresses for a single name, it'll list all of them. And I've had problems where they, you know, it was a third party, so I had no control over the host that was actually had the problem. It was like, call this service, okay, great. And every hour or so, I start getting errors. And then they go away again. And then they come back, and then they go away. And oh, one of your five servers is having a problem. Now I can try my, my queries against each of the five by IP address. And hey, look, those four work, that one doesn't. I can call my service provider, like the, the guy who gave me this URL who owns this, and say, buddy, you know, the, the server with this IP address, that's the one that's broken, this is what's happening. You know, let me save you some time so you can get it fixed faster and I can get on with my life, right? Uh, so this can be very handy. Um, yeah. The other thing with DNS is caching. Uh, if, if you're registering a new domain name or getting someone to set one up for you and you look it up before they change it, there's going to be some waiting time. And this uh, SOA record that came back in the authority section, that lists out all of the timeouts that are associated with this domain name. Yeah. So here these 900s are, uh, I guess that's 15 minutes. Yeah. So you would, uh, you would know by looking at that, you have to wait 900 seconds before the, the refresh will happen. Um, so that's also useful, just to know how long you should wait before you know if there's a problem or not. Yeah, because yeah, I've, seen, I've seen them set as high as several days in the past, yeah. which, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, I already updated that DNS record. Yeah, that's great, but, <laughs> you know. All right. <coughs> So uh, another thing that you can do to help debug things, uh, this is a little bit on the, like the Postman and Insomnia side, but it's a command line tool, is um, you want to make, or you, maybe you have made a request to a server and what happened on the, on the response wasn't what you were expecting. Um, sometimes the best thing to do is just try to type in, type in the protocol yourself. Um, you can do this with HTTP and, and IMAP, again, if you're testing email stuff, or SMTP. SMTP, again, yeah, lots of protocols are text-based, and you can look up little conversations that you can have in those protocols. So you can use um, netcat and see the command is uh, built into most, most Unix systems, including Mac and Linux. Um, and this helps a lot just because you can see exactly what happened. There isn't an application in between you and the protocol that's going to change what you're looking at. So you can see exactly what's happening. And if you're really, really not sure, you can even pipe the output into something like hex dump. So you can see, oh, are there any visible characters? Am I getting like the carriage return and the line feed? Am I getting other weird invisible characters? So um, yeah, this, this can help a lot. And if, yeah, if you want to do the same thing uh, with TLS, you can. Uh, instead of netcat, you can use OpenSSL sclient connect, and it will connect to anything that uh, that talks TLS and give you also the opportunity to type whatever you want in and see the see the response back after it's been decrypted. And last one, um, like Angelo mentioned, uh, when you're setting up a server that talks uh, TLS. Often there are problems. Some clients won't talk to it for some reason. They don't like the, the certificates. Often it's because you have to serve the whole chain of certificates that goes all the way back to the root certificate. And it, every server has a different opinion on how you're supposed to configure that stuff. And there's no, no substitute for seeing what is it that your server is sending to know if you've configured it properly. Is it the server? Is it the client? Um, so again, this OpenSSL S client uh, with dash show certs will list out everything that the server said in the TLS protocol during the handshake and list all of the certificates and show you what they all say. And um, that can give you some certainty about, yeah, I've got the server config right, the client's not liking it, there's something else wrong here, or vice versa. So summary, don't give up, right? Like the, the you know, Get someone to look to help, uh, but keep at it. You'll you'll find it eventually. Um, look for those pinch points to observe the the system, right? Trying to look at its in, at, at it in its entirety is is going to feel hopeless. 
if you can get down to somewhere where everything kind of passes through here, it's going to be a lot easier. Uh, and there's a lot of tools out there that we didn't cover, right? If you're having a problem, do some searching. Uh, you know, the, the number of, I, I, for me, it's always Unix utilities. There's always a Unix utility for that. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, in my career, one of the most useful things I've, I've done is to, to become very comfortable at a Unix command line because there's always something for whatever it is I want to do uh, or some combination of Lego bricks that'll do what I want to do. Um, but uh, yeah, and that is that. So we had, so yeah, thanks for braving the elements to come and uh, listen to our talk about uh, debugging stuff. And uh, yeah.